Good evening, everyone. Miigwech for joining our evening program. In addition to serving as the executive director of the International House Ann Arbor, I uh, also teach indigenous studies at Penn State University, focusing on the Great Lakes region, and in particular, the Niswi Ishkotewan Anishinaabe. With that, let's, uh, let's begin the pro program. Uh, I want to I want to begin by recognizing um, the land where we are meeting tonight, at least where I'm sitting. But this land uh, or a key is the ancestral lands of the Nisuish Kudewan Anishinaabe people, and uh, these nations signed the Treaty of Detroit in 1807 with William Hull, who was the governor of Michigan Territory, superintendent of Indian Affairs. The land was ceded by the three fires, which is what that Ojibwe phrase means in the first sentence, the three fires, people. After facing centuries of oppression, devastating losses, and yes, I will say genocidal violence from European and American powers. So I'd like to begin by honoring the 12 Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe communities in Michigami today who continue to steward this land. I call this the cost of education because education for native people, um, at least the residential boarding school era lasted approximately 100 years. And it was very costly for native people. I could have also called it and have sometimes the removal continues, General Pratt's war on the children. And I'd also like to acknowledge or remember Charlie Winjack, one of my, uh, well, we'll get, we'll get to him in a minute. You can see from the, from the statement below that uh, I do a little teaching at Penn State University, particularly focusing on the Great Lakes region in a program called Exploring Indigenous Ways of Knowing. And I'm also the executive director here at the International House Ann Arbor. So uh, we'll get right into it. I always, in the tradition of the people I grew up with, uh, acknowledge the elders. And the three people I'm going to acknowledge here as we begin have all walked on, as we say. They're no longer with us. They've passed in very recent months. The first one is Gijwe Jigabu, who's from the Niji Gutsuminikani First Nation. He's an elder, a Mede leader, a cultural teacher, and a fluent speaker of the Ojibwe Moan language. And on a personal level for me, he was my wet. And then Wasabikwe, moonlight shining on the water from Ponima, this little village between Upper and Lower Red Lake on Red Lake Nation, a spiritual leader, a language and culture pres preservationist and an amazing storyteller, particularly if she could tell the stories in the Ojib Ojibwe Moan language. And then finally, Namakamek, the one who stands at the center of the universe. He is an Anishinaabe elder, teacher, lecturer, author, and activist, born on the Leech Lake Reservation. Best known as a co-founder of the American Indian Movement and one of the leaders at the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. Nawakamig taught me many things over the years, some of them in the sweat lodge in his backyard. I honor all three of these amazing elders who were also mentors for me over the years. I always try to connect my own personal story with the things that I talk about. So I wanna take you to Crow Creek, Angle Inlet, Minnesota, the Northwest Angle. And if you look at the little map there, you see a purple section in that little thumb sticking up between Manitoba and, and Ontario. That is where I grew up on that northernmost point of that black line wedged in between or at the point of intersection between Manitoba, Ontario and Minnesota. I attended the Angle Inlet School 
It still stand and stands and is in operation today. There's a photo of it there in the left-hand corner. And I can tell you now that that is not the building that I attended when I was a boy growing up there. Uh, a new school was built probably 20 years or more after I left. And it, the school that I attended was about half that size. But the Angle School has the distinction of being the only school south of, uh, in the US, south of Alaska, that sits above the 49th parallel. And uh, sits adjacent to Red Lake Nation, which is that purple area there on Lake of the Woods. I said in the beginning that I want to remember and acknowledge Charlie Wenjack because it connects me, the Angle Inlet School in some ways, and the topic I'm talking about tonight, the residential boarding schools. Charlie, shown in this photo, was a resident at the Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School in Kenora, Ontario. The school that I attended to, the one I showed you, was just south of Kenora on the Minnesota side of the border. The uh, Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School uh, began in 1902 and continued or closed its doors in 1976. Charlie Wenjack was a student there with his two sisters. And I first heard about Charlie from my playmates uh, on Angle Inlet uh, or the Northwest Angle. And the whispering was, did you hear what happened to Charlie Wenjack? And on it went, he, he ran away from school. And running away from school, or as I prefer to say, escaping confinement, was uh, a common problem and experience for young native students in residential schools. But what was different about Charlie's experience was that he left the school to go home longing, lonely for his father. His mother had already passed at a young age. And uh, to see his father, who lived in Ogoki Post on Martin Falls Reserve to the, to the northeast of Kenora, Ontario, about 400 plus miles away. Charlie had never been away from home prior to going to the Cecilia Jeffrey's, Jeffrey Residential School. He had no idea how to go home. But the loneliness and the longing and the abuse that he experienced, experienced there during the short time he was there drove him down and north of the Canadian Railroad tracks out of Kenora, where he was found by an engine coming into town about four days later, frozen to death along the tracks. Charlie was wearing a light windbreaker he left carrying two potatoes, raw potatoes, and he had six matches in his pocket with 360, 370 miles left to go. This was not an uncommon experience for residential school students, but what happened during those four or five days the fact that no authorities were alerted and no officials from the residential school went in search of Charlie. It had never occurred to me growing up on the Northwest Angle with my Ojibwe friends uh, and going to that little school, it never occurred to me that I might die during the two and a half mile walk each way from Pine Creek to Crow Creek to attend school. And I left a deep impression on me that someone could leave school and be found frozen to death along the way, trying to reach home. This was the article that appeared about his death, the lonely death of Charlie Winjack. So we'll move on to early um, Indian residential schools. This was uh, a few photos of the school in Red Lake, the buildings, actually some of the buildings still stand at Red Lake, uh, Lower Red Lake, and um, 
these schools were built by missionaries operating on the residential or on the uh, reservations. And long before the residential school policy came into play or came into being as a policy, um, these photos are from roughly 1870 uh, and mission schools, day schools, residential schools were already prominent on reservations long before this. You'll notice in that uh, photo in the upper corner, right hand corner, that as they struggled to uh, separate children from their culture and their communities, they moved or built these schools often off reservation. And you can see what happened with uh, a semi-nomadic people recently forced onto small plots of land, reservation land. The parents would simply move to the yards or fields around the school so that they could, could continue to engage with their children on, or in the evenings and on weekends. Um, it's a whole another part of the uh, school and uh, school experience and mission work that was going on reservations, but I won't uh, focus on that as we continue. I wanna jump now uh, to, or move backward, if you will, to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Um, President Jackson pushed this uh, act through Congress. And um, as you know, probably most of you have heard of the Cherokee Trail of Tears, and we're most familiar with that um, experience of Native people being removed from their homelands and their communities to uh, unfamiliar territory and new geographies and new experiences from or, or all the way east or west of the Mississippi to what was known as Indian Territory. Um, of course, we have this uh, map of the five so-called civilized tribes, uh, the, the Cherokee being one, one of them, the Chickasaw and the Creek and the Seminole and uh, which one am I forgetting? Um, were, were the ones that were focused on during this, this experience. Congress actually sided with uh, the Cherokee lawsuit, um, but Jackson insisted that they be removed anyway, and they were. And it was a death march for many native people to their new, uh, new homes in Indian territory. So um, I was going to, comment briefly, and I'm just gonna make a really brief comment about the next two slides. The Cherokee were not the only tribes or nations that had a trail of tears, if you will. It happened for most in this country at different times. It happened for the Ojibwe people as well. And their trail of tears occurred in 1849 and in 1850. And, um, Chief Flatmouth of um, Northern Minnesota made this comment to Governor Ramsey, a governor of Minnesota at the time, tell him I blame him for the children we have lost. So I won't go into that bit of history, but I just wanted to point out that um, it's not only the Cherokee people who experienced this removal of um, removal from their, from their homelands. That's Chief Flatmouth. So I wanna move on to just sort of as quickly as I can um, fill you in on what we generally refer to as treaty and removal periods. Um, the US federal government negotiated treaties ratified by Congress with hundreds of native tribes across this country between 1774 and 1871, roughly 100 years. From 1832 until 1871, American Indian nations were considered to be domestic dependent tribes as defined by Chief Justice John Marshall, the Supreme Court. Remember this country was just emerging really at that time. And in 1871, the House of Representatives stopped recognizing tribes within the US as independent or sovereign nations. They were from that point on considered to be, to have um, not full sovereignty, but conditional sovereignty. 
they were dependent, um, domestic dependent nations from that point on. So that's when treaty making ended for uh, the, the, the federal government with, with native tribes across the country. The removal period began as official government policy in 1830. But keep in mind that removal had been occurring in this country during this centuries of conquest from the time Europeans arrived until 1830. But officially as government, as a new government emerging, this policy emerged in 1830 under Andrew, Jack under An Andrew Jackson. In simple terms, the treaty making period began in advance of and ran parallel to the removal period from 1830 through 1871. A shift in the conversation or a, sh a shift or conversation begins to occur between the politicians and the religious leaders regarding the role and value of education in this country. The US government began soon after the removal ended if we can say it ended, and I'm gonna argue that, the, that it wasn't an end, to implement its new Indian education policy through a federal boarding school system in the 1870s. You see the removal supposedly ended in 1870, and that removal was all about removing people from their lands. It was all about taking land, that's the conquest. Now a new kind of removal begins. So the question is, did native removal end as or if it was taught in our history classes? So we'll pick up the story on the Southern Plains and the Red River War of 1874. There's an Arapaho ledger of that war. Oops. Sorry. Um, So I wanna talk a, a bit about um, General Richard Pratt because he's key to this experience of residential boarding schools. And I want to, yeah, I'm gonna stay here for a bit. Um, General Pratt had been fighting Indians on the Southern Plains for a decade with Phil, Philip Sherman, George Crook and Nelson Miles. The Red River War broke out in 1874 and it ended quickly, spring of 1875. The last of the Indian wars on the Southern Plains was a military sort of mop up operation. That's how it was looked at, considered. General Pratt was commissioned to, to accompany 74 Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho and Apache prisoners of war to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida because they did not want to risk them leaving the reservation. You've heard the phrase, right? They're off the reservation. Is a slur, always has been. But he took them to Fort Marion, the prison in Augustine, Florida. Florida. Was it the final removal? Delivering his prisoners, he was then installed as the warden of the military prison. On the battlefield and while removing natives from their lands and homes to reservations, Pratt's ideas on native education began to evolve. Under the influence of a Puritan model of education, Pratt concluded that Indians might possibly be human, educable and civilizable. Keep in mind that that was not the view of many others. Believe it or not, in a colonizer's mind, this is progress. Liberal educational ideas at work. From 1875 to 1878, Pratt conducted an educational experiment with these prisoners of war behind the Fort Marion prison walls. While this experiment was underway, he was in constant conversation with religious leaders, for example, the late Mohawk Conference, as well as US politicians. The conclusions drawn in his classrooms behind prison walls quickly emerged as federal Indian education policy. 
the ledger of the of one of the battles. And here we see Pratt with his prisoners, 74 prisoners en route to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida. Here they've arrived at the prison and uh, we find four of these figures in this photo identified. One of them is unidentified. Pratt is on my left hand side with the hat on. Well, they both have hats on, but the one sitting on, well, they're both sitting on cannons. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, he's, he's there. I was going to make a couple of comments about General Crook's pursuit of the Apache warrior. We know him as Geronimo, but his name was Goyate. Uh, the Chiricahua Apache warrior and his small band continued to elude the US Army after these, these warriors were removed to Florida. But from 1876 to 1886, Goyati and his band surrendered two to three times and was taken each time to the San Carlos Apache Reservation in southeastern Arizona. Understandably, Goyati did not like confinement to the reservation. This was a new experience for native people across this country. So he fled again in 1885 with 130 extended family members and like-minded warriors. And he was pursued by General Crook, Crook for uh, the better part of a year, 1885 to 1886, with as many as 5,000 troops. In the end, he surrendered, his family starving, his warriors were taken as prisoners of war, also by train to Florida. And here's Geronimo, uh, or Go Goyate, and a photo of General Crook. The Carlisle Industrial, uh, Indian Industrial School began in 1879. So in a way, I'm getting just a few years ahead of, of the emergence of this school. Um, having conducted his experiments at Fort Marion, General Pratt persuaded the U.S. government to let him continue his experiment in native education, or I prefer to say extermination, at an abandoned army barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He resigned from Fort Marion to become, in 1879 and 1880, the founder and superintendent of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, the first of a network of 150 government funded residential boarding schools that spread out across the nation in a few short years. When he left Fort Marion, he took with him a number of the young Kiowa, Comanche and Arapaho men. They were the first students to attend classes at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1880. Immediately, Pratt began to travel to the Southern Plains. This was the country and the native people he was most familiar with. And he began to gather up younger and younger native children, seizing and transporting them to Carlisle with or without their parents' consent. More than 500 Apache children alone were transported to Carlisle during the first couple of years. The New York Times reported in 1879, the very fall the school opened, that children died like flies of tuberculosis, measles, influenza, and other diseases at Carlisle during those early years or early months requiring the, the creation of a boarding school cemetery. When I take my students to the Carlisle Industrial or Indian Industrial Boarding School, one of the, I let them wander around the premises. Uh, it's still run by the military, by the way. It's kind of a museum. I try to take my students there just to see what, how they react and, and also to see what the school was, was like. And it gradually dawns on them as they look out the window that there's a cemetery right below the window. And I'll, I'll show you an image later of that uh, cemetery, that field of graves. Many native people still visit that cemetery and uh, it's a, it's a challenge for them because they would like to go in and pay their respects and do what they need to do to remember those who have been left behind. And um, the military makes it difficult at times for them to, uh, to access the cemetery. 
uh, yet today. A liberal educator influenced by Puritan theology and subject to the policy goals and directives of the federal government, Pratt revealed his educational philosophy, his methodolo methodology and the federal government's solution to the so-called Indian problem at an education conference or convention in 1892, just two years after he started the school. He stated, and I quote, a great general, and he was referring to Philip Sheridan, has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the, with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. This motto hung over the main entrance to the Carlisle Indian Residential School. Can you imagine sending your children or can you understand better why as parents, they might not wanted, might not wanted to have sent their children off to school. I want you to just sort of take in these photos. I'm gonna go through them fairly um, quickly as I get going. I, I have a couple more comments to make and then I, there's a series of photos. Um, some of you may recognize Winona LaDuke Duke and, uh, and Louise Erdrich. Uh, both of them have had some influence on my thinking about this war against the children. And uh, so um, I acknowledge them. The wars did not end with the Red River War or the Apache Wars or other military removal operations on the Southern or Northern Plains among the Dakota or Lakota people, for example. So much had been endured before and during removal, relentless attacks by the US Army, theft of lands by the government and colonial settlers, imprisonment for defending land and family, confinement to internment camps, broken treaties, hunger, disease, and death. First introduced by Richard Pratt to Southern Plains Warriors at Fort Marion, and then as Indian edu Education Policy at the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding School, removal continued as a war against the children. The war now against native people and for the next 100 years shifted as an attempt to destroy or annihilate a people by destroying the culture. And that was deemed most effective by attacking the children. This educational model and policy spread across the nation in 150 federal residential boarding schools and industrial schools. Most of them operated by Protestant and Catholic churches. There were three, for those of us who are from Michigan, there were three residential boarding schools in Michigan, one in Baraga in the UP, opened in 1887, one in Harbor Springs up near Petoskey. It was open from 1889 to 1983, almost 100 years. And the third one in Mount Pleasant opened in 1891 and it closed as a residential Indian school in 1934. The photo on the left is in a historic photo of the school in Mount Pleasant. We also see here how young, how young some of these children were when they were taken off to residential school. Here we see Richard Cassidy, age four. Now, just focus on, on the photos. These are photos from the historical archives. Keep in mind that, that General Pratt was a military officer in his entire life and regimented schooling and daily life was essential both to Puritans and to his way of thinking. 
Kill the Indian, save the man. This so-called pedagogy was the continued effort to exterminate a culture and a people. To quote Osage scholar and a personal friend of mine, Tink Tinker, the larger goal was always not only the control of native peoples, but the consensual, that is legal theft of their properties, that is their land. Where the US Army destroyed the stock in the leaves, federal Indian education policy would attempt to eradicate the new and tender shoots, the hope of future generations for native people, their children. What did education mean for native children under this dr draconian policy? The first thing it meant was to civilize uncivilized people. That meant instruction in manners, Western and European manners, of course, order, agricultural work, domestic work, housework, training for menial work like ditch digging. And if it seemed to be a promising man, maybe he would be trained for some kind of industrial occupation or job, but those were rare. The focus was mostly on manual labor involving housework, farming, training and mechanics, manual labor in the schools, workshops. Keep in mind that these children at these ages were going off for half the day to do work in what we would call today's sweatshops. And then they would go to school if they could stay awake because they would be up at five o'clock in the morning um, to do reading, writing, and arithmetic, so to speak. You know, I've often wondered about this because my ancestors come from the area of the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding Schools, Lancaster, Chambersburg, Carlisle, that area, great farmland. And a lot of these children were farmed out. It was called putting out during the summer months to continue their educational process. It was free labor for European settlers. The second thing was to become individualized in your thinking. The very thesis of Euro-Western and, and Enlightenment philosophy, the very antithesis of indigenous philosophy, that is relational ways of being and knowing, they set out to destroy. In other words, to be civilized meant owning and living on the land, not with the land. It meant learning how to own a piece of property rather than belonging to the land. As US Indian commissioner, George May Penny put it already in 1856, long before the school started, for assimilation or as I prefer extinction to occur, Indians must learn to say I instead of we, me instead of us, mine instead of ours. And this was most clearly enacted after the residential school system began through the General Allotment Act in which even the, resident, even the reservation lands were divided up and parceled out so that native people could learn not how to retain their lands communally, but to own and possess parcels of their reservation property, allowing the reservation or, or allowing the government then to do what they chose with the remaining unclaimed parcels. That's a whole nother chapter of the history that we could get into, but we won't tonight. The third thing was Christianize the non-believers or the pagans to instruct them in Western values and ethics, Protestant or Catholic theology, Protestant or Catholic liturgical practices, adherence to church authority. And it's this last one that was especially, especially devastating or destructive because the very authority that was being taught in these schools was violated often, way too often by those in charge of these children. Finally, to exterminate, to rid the country of native language, culture, spirituality, philosophy, respect for the earth. In other words, all that any people would consider important for identity, 
The goal was eradication of difference, extinction, thinly disguised as education. Why is it so hard for settler state colonizers, for Euro-Americans to acknowledge the effects of war on children, the genocidal effect of this war on these children, disguised in the language of assimilation into the American body politic? Are we blind to the senseless physical brutality and mental confusion that comes with war, with the removal of young children from parents and communities? I can't help but talk about this without thinking about what's going on on our Southern border. What's been going on there for the past four years and more. Is it that we cannot acknowledge the damage we have done and the guilt we carry as a society and nation what are some of the things that occurred in the school? What was their experience? Well, removal from their parents, from families, communities, teachings, values, ceremonies, and more everything that any human being deserves and would, would desire. They were overcrowded. They were denied love and affection, discipline and guidance, the affirmation of their identities, stripped of their language, voice, worldview, replaced with forbidden knowledge and practices. Physical abuse and harsh physical discipline were common. Sexual predation and abuse were common. Malnutrition was a given. Deadly psychological or emotional devastation that comes with loneliness, fear and depression, the kind of thing that Charlie Winjack had just had enough of. Deficient medical care and death from tuberculosis, influenza, measles, and a number of other diseases. Forced labor in homes, farms, fields, mines, and various industries, especially during the summer months. And the risks of running, escaping, if you will, the confinement of the school was a common problem. I sometimes encounter denial or defensiveness or anger from people when I talk about this is the language of extermination. They'll challenge me. The language of extinction or genocide, too hyperbolic. And I refer you to the United Nations uh, General Assembly, 1948. The question, the question that Raphael Lemkin pursued his entire life, dying in poverty was this. Why is the killing of an individual a greater crime than the killing of millions? The word genocide combines the Greek word geno, meaning tribe or race, and sidera or side, which is Latin for kill or killing. It's defined as a specific set of violent crimes that are committed against a certain group with the attempt to remove the entire group from existence or to destroy them. And this is how it's defined. Any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And it lists five ways. Directly killing the members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to group members, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part imposing measures intended to prevent births in the group or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Lest we doubt that extinction was the goal of this federal policy and the residential school system, consider the words of US Indian Commissioner Francis Lepp in 1910, and I quote, the residential boarding schools were a mighty pulverizing engine for breaking up the last vestiges of the tribal mass. And Frederick Hoxie in his final promise says this goal was to be accomplished by the 1950s. Osage scholar George Tinker reminds us of those ushered into the steadily expanding system of residential schools during its four early years, first 40 or 50 years, about half Think about it, about half did not survive the experience. Roughly one quarter 
of the American Indian population during the early 20th century was physically destroyed by the process of education. Tinker recounts in agonizing detail how those who survived physically have suffered cultural and psychological devastation for multiple generations. And I have sat with them and they are my friends. It's a painful, painful recounting of history. The results of the settler colonial pulverizing engine of war on the children are present throughout native communities today. This is not ancient history. The last boarding school closed in 1991. Acknowledgement or an apology won't change these facts or history, but could help to forge new relationships or allies, which is my goal with all of my students for a new future for native peoples. I want to end because I'm going over time with an apology that was given by the Canadian government in um, 2008. I'm sorry, let me make one comment. We'll go to this short video. Kevin Gover, the director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs said in 2000, he said, we desperately wish that we could change this history. He was not speaking for the federal government. He was speaking for himself and made that very clear. In fact, he didn't re remain in his posts very long after making this statement. Gover said, but of course we cannot. On behalf of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I extend this formal apology to Indian people for the historical conduct of this agency. Gover pointed out that the agency's lengthy cultural assault on American Indians and Alaska Natives for most of its history, particularly on the children sent to Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools and their parents has yielded an annihilation of identity, a trauma of shame, fear, and anger that has passed from generation to generation, fueling too often the alcohol and drug abuse and domestic violence violence that continues to plague our country. The BIA set out, and I quote, to destroy all things Indian. These wrongs, Gover said, must be acknowledged if the healing is to begin. It has never been acknowledged in this country and we're still waiting for that apology. So now I appeal by taking you to the apology that was actually issued in Canada. Um, not that it solved everything, reparations and so forth followed this apology, but it was at least a beginning and one that we can hope for in this nation as well. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. In the 1870s, the federal government, partly in order to meet its obligations to educate Aboriginal children, began to play a role in the development and administration of these schools. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm 
and has no place in our country. The government of Canada built an educational system in which very young children were often forcibly removed from their homes, often taken far from their communities. Many were inadequately fed, clothed, and housed. All were deprived of the care and nurturing of their parents, grandparents, and communities. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis languages and cultural practices were prohibited in these schools. Tragically, some of these children died while attending residential schools, and others never returned home. The government now recognizes that the consequences of the Indian residential schools policy were profoundly negative, and that this policy has had a lasting and damaging impact on Aboriginal culture, heritage, and language. Well, some former students have spoken positively about their experiences at residential schools, these stories are far overshadowed by tragic accounts of the emotional, physical, and sexual abuse and neglect of helpless children and their separation from powerless families and communities. Residential schools has contributed to social problems that continue to exist in many communities today. It has taken extraordinary courage for the thousands of survivors that have come forward to speak publicly about the abuse they suffered. It is a testament to their resilience as individuals and to the strengths of their cultures. Regrettably, many former students are not with us, not with us today, and died never having received a full apology from the Government of Canada. The absence of an apology has been an impediment to healing and reconciliation. Therefore, on behalf of the Government of Canada and all Canadians, I stand before you in this chamber so vital, so central to our existence as a country, to apologize to Aboriginal peoples for the role the Government of Canada played in, Indian, in the Indian residential schools. To the approximately 80,000 living former students and all family members and communities, the Government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that it was wrong to separate children from rich and vibrant cultures and traditions, that it created a void in many lives and communities, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that in separating children from their families, we undermine the ability of many to adequately parent their own children and sow the seeds for generations to follow. And we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that far too often, these institutions gave rise to abuse or neglect and were inadequately controlled. And we apologize for failing to protect you. Not only did you suffer these abuses as children, but as you became par parents, you were powerless to protect your own children from suffering the same experience. And for this, we are sorry. The burden of this experience has been on your shoulders for far too long. The burden of this experience is properly ours as a government and as a country. There is no place in Canada for the attitudes that inspired the Indian residential school system to ever prevail again. You have been working on recovering from this experience for a long time. And in a very real sense, we are now joining you on this journey. The Government of Canada sincerely apologizes and asks the forgiveness of the Aboriginal peoples of this country for failing them so profoundly. In moving towards healing, reconciliation, and resolution of the sad legacy of Indian residential schools, the implementation of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement began on September 19, 2007. Years of work by survivors, communities, and Aboriginal organizations 
culminated in an agreement that gives us a new beginning and an opportunity to move forward together in partnership. A cornerstone of the settlement agreement is the Indian Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This commission represents a unique opportunity to educate all Canadians on the Indian Residential Schools system. It will be a positive step in forging a new relationship between Aboriginal peoples and other Canadians. A relationship based on the knowledge of our shared history, a respect for each other, and a desire to move forward with a renewed understanding that strong families, strong communities, and vibrant cultures and traditions will contribute to a stronger Canada for all of us.